Hi, Bernard. Hi. Hi, Good Steve. to meet you. Good to meet you. Thanks for hopping on. All right. Uh, hi, everybody. Welcome to Device Squad, the podcast for the mobile enterprise from Propelix. Today we have with us Bernard Desarno. Bernard is the founder and principal of Risley at uh, Risley.co. And Risley is the recognized product and market experts on Apple Watch and other smartwatches. Uh, since April 2015, Risley has developed a unique understanding on the platform via the development of the largest independent user panel of Apple Watch owners, which, uh, according to your website, is more than 2,500 owners. Is that still uh, accurate? It's all factually accurate, yes. Also with me today, I have my colleague, Glenn Gruber, who is a mobile strategist with Propelix. Are you a mobile strategist? Your senior mobile strategist? Yeah, I'm something. <laughs> <laughs> You're going to take that out and post, right? That little... <laughs> it's compelling. There you go. Welcome to Device Squad, the podcast for the mobile enterprise from Propelix. Device Squad, fighting crimes against enterprise mobility worldwide. Bad UI, frustrating user experiences, poorly conceived mobile strategies, we defeat them all. This podcast series will cover all aspects of enterprise mobility, including strategy, development, design, testing, and more. My name is Steve Brickman. I'm a mobile strategist and UX architect with Propelix. First, a brief history of the company. Founded in 2011, Propelix is a mobile strategy consultancy helping enterprises worldwide devise true mobile strategies and develop world-class mobile applications across all industry verticals. Propelix clients include large companies like Amway, Bright Horizons, Bank of Montreal, Dubai Airports, Family Dollar, DLL, Cintas, Merck, and many more. Propelix menu of services includes eight different mobile kickstarts, covering everything from mobile strategy and road mapping to MCOE to UI UX design to mobile testing strategy, along with soup to nuts app design development and support. Additionally, Propelix offers three homegrown enterprise mobile products. Bernard, I just want to say you know, thanks again for, for joining. Uh, I was, well, for everyone listening, I was lucky enough to have met Bernard um, back in December at the first Glance conference, which was the first conference about the Apple Watch and its future that was put on between Bernard and Baharan of Creative Strategies and then Horace Dedu of Asimco. And it was a really great event. It was about 100 people. Um, I was also lucky enough to have been on one of the panels, so I appreciate you know all of that. And that was just when we had the first, you know, we were only at Watch OS two and still on the first watch, and you know, it was a really good event. But there's so much really that's happened uh, since that time, and particularly after the announcements at WWDC just a few short weeks ago. Even that much more to talk about, which is why I wanted to invite Bernard on. So. Bernard, thank you. You're welcome, and thank you for having me. I think it's uh, always fun to have you know, those conversations with uh, all the fellows on the present and what we anticipate the future of this uh, groundbreaking product is going to be. So, so maybe you could, you know, just before we get into some of the, the rest of the discussion, give a little bit more background on what Risley is and, and how you know, you've kind of taken that forward. And you put out a, a ton of statistics you know, on your blog and, and throughout the media but tell us a little bit about what you think that we've learned in the past year or so of having the Apple Watch. You know, I've been working on this project for about a year and a half now. I, I, you know, the reason I started this is I've been in Silicon Valley, even though you can hear I'm French originally, I've been in Silicon Valley since the late 80s. And I, I personally got convinced over the last few years that wearable was going to be a very important market. And the entry of uh, Apple Watch will mark the beginning of the, of the commercial viability of, of smartwatches. And it was about two years ago, I decided to uh, focus my energies on, on this. And the first step is always trying to, in the first couple of years of any new platform, um, you can look at social and 
first mobile and the smartphone and so forth. The first couple of years, you always, you know, everyone is learning. I mean, no one really knows. Uh, we all have assumptions, we all have ideas. But as often happens, you know, some get proven right, some get proven wrong. And the best thing to do in the first couple of years is to just experiment, iterate, and learn. So I decided to do that. And knowing that Apple would not be forthcoming with any data on Apple Watch, I mean, based on their strategy, you know, and also figuring out that most of the traditional, you know, data providers, you know, the, the Comscore, IDCs, and Nielsen, these type of vendors, would also not pay attention to this product because it's too small for, for them. I figured, you know, it'd be a nice way to, to get started would be to just try to understand the product for more than just my personal opinion and other of my friends and really be on, you know, try to get a mainstream perspective. Henceforth, you know, in the summer last year, in, uh, in June, in May, June, I started this, this project and uh, with the help of Ben and a, a few other people, I, I I got to the point where indeed, you know, over the, you know, through the summer and so forth, I, I reached, you know, over, I think it's 27, 2800 Apple Watch owners have been participating on, and I think we are at up to 50, 51 surveys in just over a year. So we were originally doing once a week and I reduced the frequency in the last three months to every other week or so. Um, and then we're probably going to restart, you know, with the introduction of uh, Apple Watch, the next version or the next model in the fall comes out. Uh, we'll probably restart the frequency a little bit more. So that's the, the background. And in terms of what I learned and what we collectively learned is that the product, there's a very large um, dichotomy between what you would consider the tech media discussion around Apple Watch, which has usually been somewhat negative. And then, uh, or let's put it this way, underwhelming. <laughs> you know, I mean, many of the headlines have been, you know, Apple Watch is a flop, Apple Watch this, Apple Watch that. And conversely, looking at the mainstream users and, and finding an uh, in, inordinate amount of like and almost love for the product for essentially the, the what we also crystallize very early on is Yes, there's no like killer app. Uh, there's not like the one thing that everyone can talk about and be like, this is the killer app of the watch. Yet there are, uh, for all of us, all of those who wear it, there's like myriad, of, uh, a large number of, of little moments of delights and a lot of moments of convenience that the, the watch provide in addition to the, the pillars of the you know, notification and health lifestyle type stuff. That's the big learning is that there's really like the groundswell of the user is that, you know, the, 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 the attachment or the value the product create is very high, uh, in order to admit high. And I think as we, uh, I'm expecting based on the, the amazing progress that the new OS seems to provide that it's going to continue to drive, you know, satisfaction. You uh, definitely hit on a lot of things that I've been thinking about. Uh, like in particular, when I'm at you know online at TSA or at the gate before boarding a plane, like I invariably find one person you know near me who's got a, a watch, and I always go up to them and and ask kind of the average person, the non tech uh, insiders, what they think. And yeah, it's just glowing and effusive praise of this product, which, like you said, has no killer use case yet. Um, and and me never, but it's really interesting to see that. And um, you know, it, it's as you know Bernard said that there's a lot of these you know little moments of delight that add up to just a, a love of the product more than you know. It, it's definitely like a you know a one plus one equals three type of thing. You know, more so than you would think uh, if you just added up the value you would you would get out of it. I agree. In fact, I do the same thing, Glenn. Whenever I see somebody wearing an Apple Watch, I ask them what they think of it. And invariably, across all you know, levels of techiness, everybody says that they love it, even though they can't point at one specific thing that they use it most often for. That's the amazing job that Apple has done with this product, which is, you know, it's, it's, the, the, it's, it's kind of a paradoxical for a computer type product but the the value of the watch is that you forget you have it the value of the watch is like it's there when you need it but you don't think of oh let me open my smartphone my iphone and and go do something on twitter or facebook or or email 
I mean, the world is just there. And I, oh, suddenly you're at the store. And at least, you know, for me, it's one of my moments of delight is to pay with Apple Pay, right? It's like I'm at the store and I just pay with Apple Pay and it's there. And it's the the counter of the product. It's it's really about those very brief and short interaction that, that drive that convenience for life. Now, uh, you also mentioned that, you know, it's it's been often called a, a flop yeah, by the folks in the tech press, which is, you know, kind of, it's a little bit hilarious to me, you know, given the fact that, you know, it sold, you know, in its first year, you know, 13 million or so uh, units, which is at least an order of magnitude greater than anything that Android Wear had done, you know, collectively. Right. Um, you know, and, and given the much higher ASPs than like what Fitbit has, as an example, in the health wearable space and all of the add-ons with like the bands and other accessories, you know, it's like a $10 billion product, which is bigger than so many companies. Conversely, I mean, I, I do agree that, you know, there were some of us who were way more optimistic in terms of, instead of 13 million, right? We were, if you look back two years, a year at the announcement, you know, in September, in the six months that led to when the pricing was unknown and so forth, there were like a lot of discussion. We thought, you know, there's 500 million iPhone users, if they only sell, you know, 1%, blah, blah, blah. So we, you know, I think there was a sense that the, they will sell like 20, 30 million in year one. And in a way that they've underperformed compared to expectations. But indeed, when you put in the terms you did, like it's a, you know, five, six billion dollar revenue in the first year, it's pretty impressive. Yet, you know, Apple has an amazing distribution power. Apple has an amazing marketing power. So the jury is out. I think, you know, the, what, what is most interesting to me, and I also, you know, we've been measuring it. I'm going to measure it again next week is the perception is how many of us, when we are out and about in the street, do we see it? Because there's been the sense that, you know, in the, in the winter going through the spring that the product wasn't selling, right? There's been the price cut. There's been like the, a lot of the promos from Best Buy and, and uh, in the US and so forth. And you have the, this image that the product is not moving off the shelf yet for me personally. And I know I live in, in the Bay Area, so it's, it's clearly not the representative market, but I see more and more Apple Watches everywhere. I mean, and it's like when you use the word normal person, I mean, yeah, I mean, non-tech, you know, not like people who don't need to drive a Tesla and all that kind of stuff. I mean, it's like, a lot of people seem to be wearing one. And it's like, wow. And they also, I, st I start seeing, you know, Fitbit Blaze as well. So it's not just Apple Watch. I see more and more smartwatches out there. So I think there's, you know, the category is going to be extremely successful. I'm convinced of that more and more so. Yeah, no, it's funny. Like I saw just the other day um, a tweet by Ben uh, Baharan who, who said that, He's seeing them so often now in, in the Bay Area that he's wondering if, you know, like, you know, all of the units sold have been sold you know, only in the Bay Area. But, um, yeah, you know, I, I think that the other thing that people need to maybe view the attach rate or the adoption of this product through is, you know, not just like raw sales and comparing it to uh, smartphones, which, you know, are, you know, in, in the U.S. at least are at like, you know, an 80 or 90 percent attach rate. You know, they're, all, they're almost at full saturation. But to also compare it because of the price point to the mid-luxury and, and entry-level, you know, luxury watches. You know, right. and that market in it, I think in totality, and you probably know this better than I, so you can correct me, but, you know, that market is only like $20 billion in total, yeah. So, in comparison to that, and to the citizens and and fossils of the world, I think they've done quite well. They've you know? done, I mean, amazing. I mean, um, <laughs> if you look at it from that perspective, and I, I just looked it up to make sure I was, you know, giving you the right number. But the 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 Swiss are incredible, right? The the Swiss watchmaking industry is very incredible because they're very transparent, and every month they publish all the numbers and. If you look at the trend since Apple Watch has been on shipping, it's only one way, it's down. And the last number in May is another 10, 11% down in value, 8% uh, down in unit. There's clearly a, a global economy and effect and so forth to slow down, but it's also just, you know, the, uh, the effect of Apple Watch. I mean, it's, it's very clear. And so comparing it, you know, 
to the watch industry versus the smartphone, yeah, Apple Watch is by far the largest, probably, you know, they're probably way ahead of Rolex and, and you know, the, the Swatch group and so forth in terms of revenue already. Right. Yeah, and, and that's also something when you consider that Apple's strategy has always been to kind of cream the market and start with, yeah, the, the most uh, affluent populations and also garner most of the profit in that way. Um, yeah, the, the impact that you're seeing on the Swiss luxury brands um, is really telling. So I just wanted to ask one question real quick. Everyone I talk to thinks like, well, um, Apple probably won't put out a new watch every year because people don't want to have to switch out their watches every year. But for some reason, we assume that people would be more willing to do that with their phones and have been doing it. And I'm just wondering why that assumption exists. Like, why wouldn't people be willing to get rid of their watch every year for a new one? Yeah, I think, you know, that's a very legitimate question. I think, you know, we all love to second guess Apple. I mean, Apple has proven regularly that, you know, they just don't, they, they just don't do things the way we expect them to. So I have no idea if they're going to do one every year or every two years or whatever. I think, you know, if you look at iPod, it was like there were moments where there was like 18 months between product and other where there were like six months between products. If you look at iPad, it's a little bit the same. Um, so is, is Apple Watch like iPhone on this one-year contract renewal thing? No, but I think, maybe not, but I think the, we shouldn't underestimate, you know, how much of the iPhone smartphone model was based on the, the, you know, the industry of the phone and the carriers that have always gone through this yearly model of, so I, I don't know. I mean, look at watches. I mean, most people have more than one watch, but they probably didn't buy one every year. So I, I don't really know what to expect. I think, yeah. you know, there's clearly, you know, the assumption I have is that they're going to introduce a new model in September or October at the latest. But after that, I don't know if they'll go on the yearly cycle or if they'll go on uh, 18 months or who knows. Yeah. And, and I think a lot of like, you know, this question is also, you talk about, you know, the phones being originally grounded in, you know, the, the feature phone um, update cycle that we were used to, you know, this idea of what's the right amount of longevity for a, for a watch is similarly grounded in, you know, the Rolex Breitling, mm -hmm. you know, kind, kind of model where, you know, like my dad gave me his Rolex, you know, um, you know, he passed it down to me. People own these, you know, watches for, you know, dozens of years, Interesting, you know, if, yeah. if not longer. And it, there becomes a collectability about it, but it still does what it always did, which was only tell time. Right. So I, I think that that's the other thing where we're, we're trying to maybe apply the wrong mental model to how people will look at, you know, the watch or you know, other wearables. And also, let's not underestimate, you know, another phenomenon that I've observed uh, with the panel over the last year is, is the growing importance of bands. And very few people have, you know, it, it, it got covered early on, but very few people have been talking and focusing on that. But Apple invented an amazing, from a design standpoint, right? So everyone agreed that the first Apple Watch 1 um, might not be perfect product yet, of course, but from an industrial design standpoint, it's an amazing achievement, right? And one other thing that is amazing is this band swapping mechanism. I mean, this really is a game changer because I know for sure that, you know, I own also a Rolex and so forth. I've never changed the band for any of those watches. I mean, I would replace the band when they got really, really, really old and worn out. But I would not go and be like every other week changing the band because, oh, I like to wear, you know, something tan this week or black next week or something. And when you look at Apple Watch, it's, you know, the average user owner already owns like almost three bands per, per watch. And it's growing every, every quarter. I've been measuring it. The average number of bands owned increases. I think it's only like 15% in our panel that are still with only one band. So everybody else, 85% or so, is on two, three, four. And uh, the highest number is 37. One woman has like 37 <laughs> bands. But it's like, she's not alone. I mean, there's a lot of people who have like more than five. I mean, more than five mm -hmm. is not, is becoming, 
I mean, maybe not the majority, but it's probably a large 20%. So if you look at it from that standpoint, you know, it's another way to extend the life of the product. Um, because if you keep renewing the bands, you, you, you can make it look and feel different. And yeah, the software also, you know, clearly the new OS is, works with the current hardware and it's going to bring a slew of improvements. You can see how the, the product lasts longer than the smartphone or you, the, the need to upgrade might not be as, as strong. I, I, I mean, the jury's out. We'll, we'll see how much the hardware drives us to upgrade versus just the software. That is brilliant. I mean, yeah. because, you, because if you want to give off the impression that you're updating your watch every year, so you can do that just by swapping the band out. I hadn't thought about that. Yeah. And it's, it's, I mean, the, the, what's, I mean, I promise you, I've, I've done that with a lot of my friends, especially women. When I show them how easily I change the band, they get sold. I mean, they, and that's, that's one thing I, I've been surprised that Apple hasn't really pushed further the, the marketing of it, even though Android were recently introduced a similar feature. But, you know, can you think that the, the whole watch industry over the last dozens of years couldn't invent something like that? It's puzzling. It's like Apple has to be the one showing how you design a watch that you can swap bands like anyone can do it. It's not like you have got to take it to someone and they have to use those very tiny, you know, screwdrivers and whatever to make it work. It's just super easy. It's like genius. I own five or six bands myself, right? It's like, you know, it's going to be a barrier to moving to another product, the bands itself. Yeah. So, so it's actually the band before we, cause I, I definitely want to spend a lot of time on, on the performance improvements in watch OS three. But staying on the bands and also, you know, there's a very fashion and kind of luxury good focus that is starting to come into place, you know, within Apple mostly because, you know, Johnny and Mark Newsom, uh, like, you know, love and, you know, you've got Angela from Burberry as well, but how they've also used the bands to move up the luxury chain, co-opting footwork partnering, co-opting is probably the bad word to use, you know, Hermes and Coach with their bands, bringing their brand and brand affiliation to the watch. And even how you talk about making, you know, the watch new by adding a band, like what Hermes has done with even changing the watch face once you have their right. band on. Right. It's kind That's, of fit within that brand is brilliant stuff. Yeah. The watch face is clearly the a key piece of the next next watch. I mean, to me, this, I mean, there's been too many uh, hints of, you know, and feature change on the, the OS to make, you know, the, I mean, I think people like Neil Seibart have, have mentioned that as well. Like the watch face, you can think of the face for the watch a little bit like an app for an iPhone. It's like, it's going to be a very big battleground. I think I'm, I'm expecting that they'll open up faces with the next version and they'll have an ecosystem where you'll be able to buy and download new, new faces. So, but do, do you really think that? I mean, there's, there's been some talk. I think John Gruber, no relation to me, um, has yeah, made comments to the effect that the watch face is the one thing, and maybe Hermes is the only one that I know of where there's a custom watch face for a third party, but the watch face is going to be under tight control by Apple and not even just by saying, well, everyone has to use San Francisco font or these certain size constraints, but that they're not going to make that, you know, create this way where you can just buy watch faces that third parties who may not take the same amount of care and intention that Apple does. Yeah, I, did, I, did, I, did, I agree. Face. I mean, this is clearly uh, the, the debate, right? I don't expect to, to have millions of faces, but I think, you know, like they've done with Hermes, I think they could open that to, a, to a, you know, a, a program which would have its own set of reviews and guidelines and so forth. By the way, on with the face, it's not just the design, it's also the power consumption to go back to the, I know you want to talk about performance, it's also, you know, the, the face, you know, the display takes a lot of the battery and, you know, so they probably have a lot of technical constraints as well, not just design constraints on the yeah. display and how and for how long and all that stuff. I don't know. I'm, I'm just expecting, you know, the face to become, you know, more more valuable and, you know, they've, the change they made where you're going to be able to swap faces very easily instead of the force touch and so forth. I mean, at least in the US, I didn't see in the US, you can name them, but I was expecting, you know, they might let us rename and uh, some of those faces, so make it easier for us to uh, 
you know, swap them. But you know, it's it's. I think the the face is a critical battleground for the for the product. And it could yeah. really go either way. I mean, if you uh, Apple traditionally has a pretty tight control. Uh, if you look at like the springboard on the iPhone, you can swap out, you know, the image that appears. Uh, but really, that's about it. Same with the desktop, you know. And yeah, I true. would expect to see the same with the watch. Uh, they already are, are allowing inserting your photo, right, in the, in the watch face. Yeah, I think they realize people want and love personalization. So I think they will continue to make it m- m- more flexible while they still will retain, you know, more control than Android would, for example, yes. Right, right. I, th- I still think it's a, they, they know it's an important piece of uh, how the user love the product or not to make it their own. So within certain constraint, I'm expecting it to be more open over time. Yeah, I think for a lot of people, or a lot of companies, yeah, the, the competition for the watch face is not the design of the face itself, but how do I get my complication to be one of the you know, two or three yeah, displayed because that's uh, what I think people are going to in- end up interacting with the most, even with yeah. the new device I mean, stock. And I think that's the point of doing the new feature for to make the the face swappable more, more easily is to for Apple to to realize that and say we cannot just be stuck with two or three. We need to enable an ecosystem at least you know maybe ten or twenty. So the assumption is that you will create watch faces for a specific occasion. Like when I go running, that's the face I want with the complication I want. And when I'm traveling, that's the face I want with the complication I want. So you'll have your American Airlines or your TSA complication on that one type thing. I'm assuming that's the design intent for swapping face is to being able to have, you know, context specific, you know, uh, faces. And same with, you know, at, at home versus at work, you know, at work, you base. Know, your, calendar and your you know to-do list something and maybe at home you'd want something else i mean i would expect you know this to be context aware exactly yeah the biggest knock you know on on the watch you know particularly from the tech press at the beginning was you know the slow performance and now with watch os3 with no change to the silicon that issue is gone I mean, everything that I've seen, I, I, w- I wasn't at WWDC. I haven't gotten a chance to play with uh, the current developer beta yet. But it looks like an unbelievable leap, you know, that no one would have expected could have been done without an update to the hardware itself. So first thing, you know, going back to what you said a little bit earlier, Bernard, the CSAT last I saw from uh, your research, I think the top two box was like 92% or something in that order of magnitude. So it can improve, but where can it really go? I think the high water marker so was like 97%. So I think it's a good question, and I think it can improve in multiple ways. Um, the 92%, you know, is first of all, is a combination of very satisfied versus satisfied. And if you look at the mix, the mix has trended down in terms of people who were very satisfied early on when I first measured it in July last year when the number was 97%. So the, the aggregate score went down and then more people that used to be very satisfied moved to just satisfied. So I think the, the new OS and the new hardware will move people back, I think, in the very satisfied ex- as opposed to just being satisfied. That's one way to look at it. The other is if you look at recommendation, we haven't really published those because it's a little bit complicated sometimes to, to share some of these, but we also track, you know, what's called an, an, uh, the NPS, right, the Net Promoter Score for the product. And the NPS is rather low. You know, it's in the mid-20s about, which, you know, to compare it to an iPhone, which is over 80 as a Net Promoter Score. So what that says is, like, while people are satisfied with Apple Watch, they're not yet ready to recommend it to a lot of people. That's understandable, right, because we all kind of like it or love it or very attached to it, but at the same time, we're all very cognizant that, you know, it, it is a version one product and it's not perfect. The performance was and has been, you know, very critically um, perceived problem. And it's, so performance was, has been in two areas, right? The first is the general day use of the product, right? You touch the screen, it would respond a little bit, you know, the, the response, freq- I mean, it's just not quite there yet. Type thing. So all of the UX interactions are a bit sluggish. And then the second big pillar has been the apps and third-party apps, which have been, you know, 
a joke, right? The, the whole tech industry has been joking about these third-party Apple Watch apps because they've been incredibly slow, incredibly underpowered, and incredibly, you know, not really that useful outside of the few productivity ones like, you know, the weather apps and things like Fantastical and, and so forth. So the, I think that's the area where the new OS is bringing amazing uh, improvement is on this notion of third-party apps and not only that the performance of those apps will be noticeably faster, at least from a perception standpoint, but that they're going to be much more capable. I mean, the amount of work they've done to open up uh, further, many more APIs and making it much more, you know, useful to to do things that you know developers have, have been trained to do is amazing, and that's that should create, in my opinion, a whole new V two of the third party uh, app system around Apple Watch, and you know, then we should expect you know the classic you know the flowers bloom and have people come up with things that we hadn't thought before. Do you have any reviews of the uh, the new OS? I didn't install it on my own watch because you also need to install the uh, latest iOS. And since I only have one iPhone, I didn't want to risk the beta on that because the, it's a very early developer beta. So I'm waiting for the the next one. But I've had you know I've had conversation with other folks who've done it, and they they do confirm that the uh, the, the performance of the apps and third-party apps is un- unbelievable. I mean, at least the perception of them, because you, you, the data is updated. You know, you just flick at them, and the data is there, and it's, it's updated and so forth. So it does work. So, you know, one, one other thing in, in terms of what might now be possible, um, but, but also just looking at Watch OS 3, and yeah, just how that might address some criticism. One of the criticisms that I've heard, and I think it was in a podcast between you know, John Gruber and, and Marco Arment recently, was that, you know what, this is the OS that Apple should have launched with. Like they shouldn't have done watch OS and then watch OS 2. But I mean, do you agree with that? Or, or do you think that you know, there's no way they could have made these improvements unless they were able to observe how people use it in the first place. I mean, hell, they thought that people were going to use digital touch and send heartbeats, and clearly, like, nobody did that. Like, I think it's a, it's a who cares debate. I, at the end of the day, I mean, I'm, I'm sorry. It's like, yeah, I mean, for me, it was puzzling to see Apple pushing to get thousands of developers with watchOS 1 to come up with apps that were essentially useless. I mean, just glances and, you know, so that was a bit puzzling, but now it's like, who cares if they did it on purpose or not? I mean, who knows? I mean, they might not even know themselves. I think, you know, the point is that they've addressed the problem. I think that's really what's most important. It's like they realized, you know, that they made several mishaps and it's not the first one. I mean, do you remember the debate about cut and paste on iPhone? That lasts three years. So, I mean, it's like, Guys, we have to come down a bit and relax. It's it's not the end of the world. The apps were crap, yes. The app, the the the, the watch was slow, yes. And yeah, guess I mean, good. Oh my god, very important. They've listened to customers and they're fixing it. Yeah, of course. It's a debate that doesn't have any merit outside of the tech echo, echo chamber. It's like, of course, it's interesting for Gruber and Marco to discuss this type of stuff, but it's like, really, it doesn't affect anybody else. I mean, no one's gonna start writing apps until or unless the perception of the market success is going to change besides the, you know, and at the same time that the API allow a developer to do what they want to do. And the prior APIs were very weak. I mean, there were not that many things you could do outside of the health side. Right. It's all very theoretical, but it's still interesting just from like a product rollout perspective that perhaps Apple knew that nobody was going to use the, the friends carousel, but they knew they needed that button there. So, I don't know. I don't know if they really thought people would use this digital touch or not. I don't know. I really have no insight personally on the... I mean, from the first day, I was puzzled because we obviously, we all know that without a network effect, you know, what would you use those features and who would you use, use them with? So, that's a bit puzzling, but who knows? I mean, really, I don't think in the big picture they, they're that important. I think the... Uh, 
the, the thing that was clear is that there was a big push. If you look, compare the, the marketing messages from Apple uh, at the September event and at the April event to where they are now, they've learned. I mean, they've really changed the marketing. They've changed the positioning. They de-emphasize a bunch of stuff and re-emphasize other. So I think, you know, they do what every company does. They, they listen and they correct course. I think that's fine. And the, the good news is compared to iPhone, if you look back, they're correcting much faster. Much I mean, faster. Much faster. It's like people, you know, give them blame for everything. It's like we had WatchOS 2, you know, three or four months that made it at least bearable to do apps. WatchOS 1 was absolutely useless, right? So at least they corrected as soon as they could, you know, five months later. Yeah, I feel like we're seeing a lot of the same trends, though, if you think about the first uh, iPhone OS where everything was sort of super kitschy and they were leaning on, you know, these really cool looking designs as a way to sort of hide the fact that the the functionality wasn't quite there. And we're seeing the same with the watch, with sending your heartbeat and and the, the friend's carousel, things that are visually very cool looking. And now they're sort of replacing these things with more usable features and, and p- pushing the UX forward towards the user just as they did when they, you know, went to iOS 7 on the phone. Yeah, I think, you know, the, I mean, to me, the rate of improvement is very impressive for Apple Watch. I mean, if you, we, we are very impatient, right? But I think it's, it's a product that is been in the hands of consumers for just over a year since, you know, late April. And it's pretty amazing. So one thing that, you know, at, at WWDC, you know, Craig Federighi mentioned that a lot of their ability to bring forward, some, you know, these significant performance improvements were because initially they were just like petrified that if they were looser with the re- resources on the watch, that, you know, the, the watch wouldn't last through the day and, and that would really be bad. But clearly, we've seen a lot of things where people are getting through the day and still having 50% of the battery left and therefore that allowed them to do this. How does that align with maybe some of the research of how you saw people were saying that they were using the watch and, and, and were you even tracking what people said their battery life was like? Yeah, we tracked that. For, you know, I think that was a second or third survey we started tracking this and we tracked a couple of times after and essentially we realized very early on that it was a non-issue because a lot of people were concerned about that not just apple but the if you look at the press between september and april there was a lot of the, the debate and as soon as the product was released when people said you know oh the battery is only going to last a day and this and that there was a lot of negative from the the, the media and from a user standpoint it's been we measure it at 96, 97% of not an issue. Um, the watch lasts the whole day and it's not an issue to, to get in the habit to charge it at night and uh, put it on the bedside table. And that was early on and very, you know, moving from there, um, a subset, about 20% of the, the one we've uh, the surveyed only charge it a couple of times, you know, 20 minutes here, a little bit time here when they take a shower and, and they wear it at night while they sleep. So if you look at the broad picture, not that many companies get consumers to, cre- to create new behaviors so easily in a way. But they were very consistent on that, saying it will last only a day and you're going to have to charge it at night. And we've designed the charger so that you can put it on the bedside table and voila. And people do and people are not upset about it. Just to get back to the UX a little bit, I wonder... Um, this fast acceleration and improvements, how much effect it will have on uh, the iPhone interactions that we see in this latest update. They improved something that's been on the phone forever, this back and forth kind of navigation that you see so often. And they came up with this very simple solution they call vertical paging, where instead of having to go back and then to the next item in the list, you can just scroll up. Right. It will take you to the next item. And I wonder why they never did that on the phone. And so I'm thinking that maybe this will raise all boats. Yeah, it does. I mean, and, and think about, I mean, the, they could start on the watch and then end up on the phone or on iPad and so forth. I mean, Force Touch was the first product to have, Force Touch was um, Apple Watch. The first product to have Taptic Engine was Apple Watch. So I think, right. you know, uh, 
that you see innovation from Apple Watch to your products and vice versa, I think is, is to be expected, yes. I think the, you know, the, the, the industrial design and all, all of those advancements from a high-level UX standpoint are moving very quickly. I think I, I'm convinced that Apple knows that by, you know, the, the better the watch is, the less dependence and the less usage of iPhone people have. And I think that's what's amazing is they're okay with it. Other companies would probably not because, you know, it's creating, you know, some level of cannibalization themselves. Yeah, I mean, there's still some dependencies that the watch has on the on the phone, right? So. Oh, they will. I mean, I'd be super surprised if the next hardware is totally independent from the phone. I think this is at least two generations away. Right. From techno- just from a technology standpoint, there's too many issues. And I mean, unless they're really much more advanced than anyone think, I guess. Yeah. The only thing I'm hoping is that they'll at least figure out a way to enable GPS without the phone so that you can go take a run and not have to put your phone in the armband or have it jangle around in a pocket. GPS is often requested the uh, a better Wi-Fi because the, the Wi-Fi cap- capability is very limited, which is very puzzling the way it works. But people expect, you know, I think there's a, a, a pretty large sentiment that, you know, they could and should upgrade the, uh, the, the Wi-Fi capability so that you can tap onto more internet capabilities, you know, when you're at Starbucks or wherever. And yes, GPS seems to be uh, very often requested. Now, one, one of the theory that's discussed is the notion of using the, an extension via the band, smart bands, for a bunch of these things and not just thinking about the watch as it is currently and the case and the space and the, for the battery and the processor, the memory and so forth as is, but I mean, think about it. I mean, in terms of skin, uh, real estate, right? The band is a lot more space than the the case itself. So there are tons of things Apple and or third parties could do with the band as well and this notion of smart bands. To go to, to the theme of, you know, Apple Watch and the enterprise, you know, I can see how over time as they open up not just the, the SDK for the the watch as part of the, the the case, but also this notion of smart bands that, you know, you open up a, a slew of applications that could be used in the enterprise world, industrial world, and so forth. Do you think that watchOS 3 legitimizes, you know, the watch as something that enterprises should target? Like, is it that much of an improvement in your view that, yeah, it didn't pay to invest much time on, on the first two versions, but now this is a little bit more ready for prime time? I, I think you're going to see gradual uh, swell movement of developers themselves. From, a, from my conversation with, you know, it's becoming more interesting. So, right, innovation comes from both top-down, like we need to build this, but also bottoms-up where people just are curious about it and see what can you do with it and, and could you or could you not do. I think in terms of uh, developers, Interest. I think the the new OS we clearly get more people interesting in trying to do things because the uh, the SDK is is much more capable, right? There's and we haven't even mentioned it, but there's a beginning of a game engine in it. There's a lot of things that they've added to the SDK. Yeah, I I can see you can start doing some clever, interesting type apps. So I think there will be you know some groundswell movement there. In terms of um, top down, I, I think people will and should wait for the see what they do on the hardware side. This, I mean, I'm assuming that they will improve the the hardware, you know, significantly in the next model. So I think I would I would wait and see what you know what that what it is and what it can do and can do. Do you think yeah. there's anything that Apple can do to increase adoption in the enterprise? I think the okay. enterprise, as you know, is has become an incredible focused market for Apple in the last few years. It's, I mean, it's not discussed as much because it's more complicated to understand, but, you know, the relationship they built with Cisco and IBM and a lot of the work they're doing in the field is, is clearly, you know, iPad Pro is supposed to be, a, you know, just for the enterprise, right? It was a product designed for the enterprise. I think 
So Apple as a business is very focused on the enterprise. And I think Apple Watch will play a role in that. There's both the view that, you know, Apple Watch could be a subsidized product, at least in the U.S., but the subsidized health plan of companies, but also, you know, what type of applications and productivity type enhancement we can get from Apple Watch on campus. And so you have all of the security thing that's going to become important, right? As a user, I would love that the biometrics or the, you know, the sensor data builds a biometric signature and gives me more authentication and I don't need to input this, you know, four digit code on the watch, which is a pain in the butt. So yeah. I'm expecting, you know, this could be a, 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 you know, the secure identity, um, you know, secure keys and, you know, access control could be a way where, you know, it becomes a viable product instead of distributing badges and whatnot. Yeah, and it's actually what, what you what they showed at WDC of using the watch to just you know unlock your MacBook. Right, but I'm, uh, I'm expecting also you know, the, my watch is only secured for my four digit code, right? So that I put on the watch. So what I mean, I, technically, I can see how the the sensor data could become a signature, right, and be like, okay, this is you know moving to the next level, be a biometric type uh, secure aspect but you know this is more of a wishful thinking on my part probably than the reality but that's kind of i think directionally some of the areas that they'll work on that they will be working on that will create value for the enterprise not just on a, as an application platform but more as a secure identity access control and so forth yeah and maybe that's where device independence becomes more significant too that you know, employees would be able to use a watch without having to own an iPhone or without the company having to distribute also iPhones. Yeah. Yep. And, and the, um, so in terms of enterprise, I've, I've personally, it's, it's more of an observation more than, I don't know if there's a business yet, but I've noticed at least in the Bay area. So my statement is geo fence to, uh, the San Francisco Bay Area, but I've noticed a lot of people who are in the hospitality business, like in first line service, wearing Apple Watch, where the business, you know, restaurants or it's been, you know, I've seen in restaurants and in uh, this type of environment, the, the management wants the employees to not have to pull up phones, you know, to do face to face service type thing. So I can see how, you know, Apple Watch becomes you know, productivity or business tool in, in the retail environment to, you know, where it's important for consumers and employees to have face-to-face -face conversation and not like shoulder-to-shoulder -shoulder type thing. Yeah. I think also even just for simple alerts using the haptic feedback um, to say, hey, there's something you should be taking care of, you know, might you know, get missed a lot of times if the phone's in your purse or your pocket or somewhere else. Yeah, and, and frankly, yeah, just from a productivity standpoint for the organ for an enterprise, if it just gets people to meetings on time, that's <laughs> probably you know, <laughs> pays for itself on its own. Yeah. yeah Especially really. if it counts the steps of the people going from one meeting yeah. to the other. So actually w one other kind of related question with, with the enterprise, you know, one of the messages out of WWDC was you know, now a focus, it used to be like yeah, I think what was it? Josh Clark at, at Glance talked about the nano moments, you know, of seven seconds or less. You know, and now they're talking about two seconds, yes, you know, or less interactions. Now, now clearly, a couple of those sections have been bought back just by making the device more performant. But there, there is that question of, you know, how much can you really? Other than I think what you've said about identity is spot on. I think great opportunities there. Um, but how much can really be accomplished with the watch within the enterprise in these really, really tight interactions? Ah, I'm a huge believer of uh, hands-free interaction. So there's a lot of industries where, you know, you, for safety or, or productivity, you need people to be hands-free and not have to look at the screen and, you know, try to type on the phone type thing. So I think there's a bunch of things there, like, you know, you can see, people meet checking meters and stuff like that where you, you don't really, you want them to be hands-free. So I think there's opportunities there. I think the second is Apple Watch is part of an ecosystem, right? We have to, to look back at the whole platform view, you know, car kit, home kit, and beacons. And with, you know, beacons have been 
under talk, you know, last couple of years, there were over talks three, four years ago when they got introduced and people were expecting those beacons to do everything with smartphone. People realized that beacons and smartphones don't work because consumers were not looking and pulling the phone to look at what the, the beacon would say. But I think, you know, the, the converse is true with Apple Watch or smartwatch. It's like the watch is there on the wrist and the notification triggered by a beacon that would do something smart is there. So I think there's going to be a lot of innovation around this multi-dimensional world and not just, you know, Apple Watch as an app on, on, on the Apple Watch itself, but more like how Apple Watch is a remote control in a way around what's around us. And I think in a lot of industries and jobs, I mean, you probably can see use for that. That's really great. Bernard, so we covered a lot of uh, ground, but like, is there anything major that we missed or something that you were like, yeah, these dummies should have asked me this question? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I have, uh, no, I think we, we covered all the, the, the pillars of, uh, of the product. And, you know, obviously I'm biased, you know, for the, <laughs> its success. So I'm sure everyone who's listed can uh, understood that, but I, I still, I'm very passionate about this product. I think the category, more, more than just the product, there will be other smartwatches that will be successful. I think the category is incredibly exciting for the industry and, and a lot of great things will happen, hopefully. Awesome. So, so Bernard, bef- before we close and, and sign off, um, if people want to learn more about Risley, uh, where can they find you on the web, on Twitter, or anywhere yeah, else? Yeah, I'm on uh, risley.co uh, is our website as basic information, and then I'm on Twitter. Either my personal handle, which is bdesano, which no one is going to get, or Risley <laughs> Research, uh, either one or the other. Risley Research is probably the, the easier one to find. All right. Well, great. Well, then that wraps it up. Bernard, thanks so much for hopping on. And Thank you for having me, Steve, and look forward to seeing the next Apple Watch. Yeah, really. And Glenn, thank you for hopping on as well. Sure, it's my pleasure. Thanks again, Bernard. And stay tuned for the next episode of Device Squad, the podcast for the mobile enterprise from Propellix. Bye-bye, everybody. All right, bye-bye. Thanks, guys. Bye-bye.